Prasanna, I wanted to ask you this. Why yeah. is the judiciary so excited about this? Right? Like we know that the judiciary was so excited about the e-courts project. Um, it, I would say it did bring some transformation of getting out judgments in an easier way, right? Like you could go check the website and you get the judgment. But again, they know how to evade it. Like my own case in Telangana, I had to pay 2000 rupees to get the judgment because they wouldn't upload it because it's a very sensitive case. So <laughs> there are ways they do it. They evade this accountability. Uh, but why is there so much excitement within the judiciary about this, even though it's not the judiciary that is being building it? Well, uh, I mean, there is a short form answer and there is a long form answer. Right? Short form answer is that they've really not considered this judicially. Right? They think this is, this is something that is going to increase their efficiency because there is, I mean, there is generally there is so much criticism about how inefficient our judicial system is. So they say anything, anything that promises to even correct that, that, I mean, there is a tendency to jump at those solutions, right? I believe when this gets considered judicially, looking at what are all the problems and how it affects rights of people, the answer may be different depending on who the judge is and who the bench is and what their judicial philosophy that they bring to the table is and all of that. But, but as I said, so there is, and you know, the present Chief Justice of India, we know he has talked about AI quite a bit and in fact, trying to employ AI to solve various kinds of problems. So, so that's the thing. So the tendency is that you have, you have this problem, these mountains of cases that, that need to be closed soon. And then you, you something that promises to make your system efficient, yeah, there is a tendency to jump at that and say, uh, this is something that we need to try out. And specifically during COVID time, because that seems to be the flavor of the season to say any tech solution right so is welcome any solution is welcome whether it actually solves the problem or problem or not or whether that is even a problem or, not, or what other problems that that solution leads to Tony has a question can you explain how vehicle data is being there in icjs is different from a policeman asking the details against a vehicle number from a scene of crime uh, so okay so the issue is not asking you details of where you were like so if you are an accused or if you're a suspect uh, in a criminal case they have every right, uh, part of the Evidence Act and part of, uh, I guess, Prasna can uh, tell you more about the legal side or under the, the IPC to ask you details and you will have to submit it. But all of this is also when they ask you these details, they, they call you, they issue those notices. It's all uh, democratic in nature. There is at some level both administrative and legal procedures that do take place and it's all on record. But... But what's happening in this scenario is there is no crime. Like if you look at the Telangana case, there is no crime, but they are stopping you on the streets because you look suspicious. You are heavily built. If you are heavily built, it's been a historic case in Hyderabad. If you look like a gunda, you are a potential gunda. So we will try to detain you, question you under the gunda act, under the uh, prevention, detention principles of the gunda act, right? So, so anyone who looks suspicious, I, I mean, if you look suspicious, if the police detain you, ask you to show your ID card, that's perfectly valid. But the issue is nobody trusts ID cards anymore because they have realized that ID cards can be gamed and they're like, no, we can't verify your ID card. Even the other cards that they said, we will verify it because you all know what the problems are with, with verification around data. They stop trusting ID cards. So what they are essentially doing is they are like, we will extract information from the individual at the scene and we'll try to, we will try to determine who they are. It's, it's nothing to do with us individual trying to identify who we are to the police. It's the police trying to identify who you are. And in this process, uh, if you, if they have access to your vehicle uh, details, it's just not it's just not that they can determine who you are. They can also determine your travel patterns and where you have been through because of all the CCTV networks that are being now converted, right? Like I haven't 
uh, mentioned that, but essentially when you're talking about 360 degree profiles, it's not just criminal in nature. It's also your personal details uh, that are becoming part of the system. And I mean, I'm not even ag against this idea if you're trying to use this to solve a crime, but there is no crime here. Yeah. The violation is you are getting access to my details without a crime, right? Like uh, it's, it's against the whole idea of the evidence act. You only ask evidence when there is a crime. Without a crime, this whole idea of preventive detention or preventing a crime is being sent overboard uh, now uh, with these databases. Like in the past, uh, uh, if you were someone who, who were uh, who were supporting certain form of revolutionary ideas, right? Uh, you were detained for publishing a book or even meeting, conducting a meeting, conspiracy theories, all of that. Uh, you don't need any of those anymore for the preventive detention. All they have to do is that you have been at a particular location at a point of time, accidentally, where there was a crime. Right? When they collect all the call data records, if there was a crime and they try to trace uh, who are the individuals at the crime scene, they're trying to obtain call data records to determine that. Now, if you, by being part of these databases, uh, they are able to determine every individual who was at a point of time at a particular location or at the scene of crime. And you are now a suspect. And the burden to prove that you are not... Uh, actually the one who has committed the crime is on you. It's no more on the police to determine that uh, you are the one who has committed the crime or to arrest you. You will have to go tell them that I was there because I was doing some other work. You will have to prove to the police official that you were in there to commit that crime at that point of time. So this inverses the relation on between uh, an individual and the criminal justice departments, whether it's the prisons or the police, right? Like if, even if you're a journalist, say as a journalist, you go interview uh, someone in the prison, you are now part of the network, right? Like you visited a criminal. And uh, that is something serious because, and what's also happening is the idea of the criminal justice system was always on, uh, okay, uh, it should be rather, it was never, it should be around reforms, right? Like you were trying to ensure that the individual who has committed a crime gets reformed when he stays his time in a prison and he comes back better back into the society. By essentially tracking every prisoner, past prisoner, and even when he's on bail, by tracking all of his details, you're making it hard for an individual uh, to be reformed because the moment there is a crime in case of Hyderabad, uh, the Hyderabad police goes and catches the nearest guy who is a past known criminal from the, who is just out of the prison. So, and that sharing of this information and harassment that, oh, you are the criminal, you are the potential accused is going to be a serious problem. And it's just mere harassment of people. And we have witnessed this at scale in Hyderabad, part of the pilots. Thankfully, they stopped because of some criticism from the public. And nobody knows that this is happening, right? Especially the media. Uh, whatever happened in Hyderabad is unknown. Whatever uh, is happening with, within Delhi, for example, Delhi already has this. So if you're talking about the recent Delhi protests, uh, and when you're talking about the facial recognition system, you're only looking at that. But it's not just... Uh, these uh, facial recognition system or fingerprint systems. It's all the other databases that are being interlinked to this criminal justice system that become evidence. And it's very easy to manipulate digital evidence, by the way. We are witnessing that. I mean, I mean uh, it's really easy to go change a lat long of uh, my uh, call data records to say that I was at a potential protest, even though I was never. Like, how would you? verify that the digital evidence that they have is accurate, right? Like there is no law around all of this. This, this is just becoming part of the uh, judiciary and the cases because the judiciary is actually recognizing the system without a law. Yeah, yeah that's um, so I have three or four. Uh, three or four points, uh, Rohini. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Rohini. If you yeah. want to follow up that question, I'll... 
yeah the so so everything that they get from this icgs would now be part of like circumstantial evidence or, or how does it uh, play with when he says it becomes digital evidence don't they still have to put that together before they accuse somebody or just having yeah. Yeah, I get your question. So I'll let uh, three or four parts to this. Right? One is how does uh, any crime investigation work? First, there is a complaint. There is somebody, something that is initiated. And you know, therefore, you're trying to pin down the responsibility for the crime to so many people if the identity of the accused is not known, etc. Trying to see who did it. So normally, all of this data is collected by the respective people and it is kept in separate silos. Even to demand this data, you need to show you are actually investigating this crime for which you need this data. And then that data is provided to the police under a certificate under the Evidence Act, digital label. So this is, I am a responsible officer, for example, in Airtel. This is the call record data of this number that you have, that you have suspicion. This is how typically when there is a crime investigation happens. So where is there's a safeguard here against digital planting, etc. here is that see the, the person providing this data, the Airtel officer is not part of the police force. So therefore there's nothing, there's no reason to doubt his credential and he is issuing a certificate under his name, under the Evidence Act, under the uh, oath and therefore there's nothing to disbelieve him. Therefore that corroborates the police theory that a particular person was there on the crime scene, etc. So you change this. So where there is, there is real time accumulation of lat long data by the police, for instance, under the ICJS, there's still some doubt as to whether that is going to happen, but certainly the model suggests it will happen if that is the case. So what happens is the, everybody is effectively a suspect from day one for crimes that are created, committed now and for the crimes to be committed tomorrow and day after and next year, etc. So so the police has all the information so if there is an if there is a crime if they want to link a to the crime b for whatever reason they can do it just by a switch in their database and that is what Chinivas was explaining and whether see whether we should distrust the police should distrust the police in fact the whole point of the criminal procedure court the whole point of the criminal justice system Certainly in India is distrust of police, which is why your statements to the police are not admissible in court, even if you have confessed to your crime. Which is the reason why there is the, the distrust of police is certainly a key aspect of our criminal justice system. And therefore, you can't turn that on its head and say that's why do we need to distrust police? Because we need distrust of police is important. That's only only in a process that has certainly distrusted the investigating authority. Only then, when a person accused is guilty of offence, then he is deemed to have received a fair trial under, under our system. That's one part. And the second part is this aspect of trying to pin down everybody as a suspect. So this came to be considered in our Aadhaar five judge judgment, the five judge bench judgment. So where, if you re recall, so Aadhaar linking for bank accounts was to be done for all bank accounts mandatory. So there were rules passed under the Pre Prevention of Money Laundering Act. The Prevention of Money Laundering Second Amendment Rules 2017 was passed. And that is what made Aadhaar linking mandatory. So these rules were struck down by the Supreme Court precisely for this reason. It says it's disproportionate to say everybody is, doing, is, everybody is a money launderer. That kind of presumption itself is unconstitutional. You will have to presume everybody to be innocent and say and do as view as a non-restrictive a measure as possible to be able to catch money launderers. Right? It, I mean, that you don't have an efficacious method is not really an excuse for you to net everybody as though they are a suspect. So that's number two. So where the proportionality and whether you can even have this presumption of everybody being uh, guilty or a suspect that itself is unconstitutional, that is now settled. And the third aspect Srinivas very briefly touched upon it, where you say, I mean, in our criminal justice system, and I mean, where, I mean, completely uh, across the civilized world, 
when you do a crime you do the time that's the that's the philosophy that we but here what is the time the time is i mean in our constitution it's punishment and it says so you don't get punished more than what the law had prescribed at the time you had committed the offense if at at a particular point 7 years is the maximum punishment example for murder right subsequently it is it is uh, changed to life imprisonment but when you committed a murder at a time when the punishment was merely 7 years you can only be punished for 7 years that's the, that's actually a express guarantee under article 20 of our constitution where you are not punished longer for longer than what it was the prescribed punishment at the time you committed the offense right this is called ex post facto no ex post facto guarantee so here what happens is now because you now have this trail being followed you've been traced throughout your life your time as i mean even if somebody is an accused uh, is guilty of an offense under the act once he serves the sentence he he is entitled under the law to start his life afresh nothing of that really should stick right so in fact if that sticks then really the punishment is not really the what is prescribed under the law right you need to give that so it's not really just reformative as uh, as uh, senior has put it of course that is there but also because that's the guarantee that's the civilization guarantee that we give so i mean we are a civilized society we don't punish for more than what is required what is prescribed under the law right anything even so what is a punishment punishment when you say put somebody in jail what does it mean you are effectively depriving that person of valuable rights under the constitution you are depriving that person of free right to free movement you are depriving that person of right to free of liberty so similarly when you actually take away that privacy for entire life it is as good as life imprisonment because you are depriving the person of that right for the rest of his life so that's another aspect so where it also is a violation of constitution if you are effectively storing the person's data i mean even if somebody is guilty of it so you effect i mean you try and record that forever and use that and and net him as a suspect for any further crime etc this so where in fact i mean it's been there since time immemorial police stations have what is called history sheeters and now we also have uh, people advancing this sex offenders registry where anybody who has ever been accused of a sexual offense sexual harassment or sexual assault offense gets into this registry and therefore people are, it's there for people to look up and uh, be careful about them or whatever right so even that again is will be a violation of that guarantee under the article 20 of our constitution yeah the issue there again is that uh, you don't know if the guy again i'm not this is not to support any sexual offender but you don't know if there was a crime or if it hasn't been you don't know if he was a criminal or is an accused he, he remains an accused forever because you don't know a that you're part of the system and you don't know if you can be it can get out of the system and this is very problematic especially for the lgbtq community who are routinely harassed by the police in india right so it's there are challenges to these uh, unilateral identification of the state of individual saying that this person is a sexual offender because he he dresses as a transgender right like that can't be the basis but unfortunately that's the basis because we we have seen enough police departments wrongfully uh, uh, accuse of accuse you of crimes and it, it's it's an harassment that's always been happening uh, and the issue is we don't know to what extent these systems will enhance it further because you could be part of these systems and you would never know why you were part of these systems because you will never know you are you, you are already in the system because you all of you have a driver's license right like you are in the system and you you never knew that you were in the system it was the case for telangana individuals too right like we had no idea that the state has created this new digital id system based on facial recognition and the police has access to all of this and and the reason i'm we are discussing this now is also that because uh two days ago the parliamentary committee on personal data protection uh, 
actually ha held a consultation with the officials from the MHA. Uh, I mean, the reports from Media Nama and uh, elsewhere from PTI, I guess, uh, that the MHA, NCRB, uh, Registrar General of India were all lobbying for them to be exempted. And the exemptions are primarily for these national databases. I mean, in case of the Registrar General of India, it is for the National Population Register, also which will be part of this. Like when you're talking about immigration data, the immigration data comes from the Registrar General of India as well. It's all centralized at the MHA, but what you're witnessing is interdepartments within the MHA and outside are sharing this information and they all want exemptions for it. The problem though is uh, all of this needs a separate law in itself. I mean, that's the whole thing the fundamental right to privacy judgment talks about. And even in case of the other judgment, it outrightly says that these idea of 360 degree profile itself is flawed because uh, not only they say that Aadhaar cannot be used to build this system, saying that if at all those systems will be built, they are unconstitutional is what, uh, or they form, they become surveillance is what they recognize in their judgment. Okay, uh, I have one and There's another question, question from Rahul. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, do, ahead, we know, do we know whether these systems, databases, logs, when data was added, altered, who did it? Uh, okay. So essentially Rahul is asking me this, like if, if someone in the police department does a search uh, trying to identify me, will there be a log in the police department? They don't have to tell me necessarily, but will there be a log when there was uh, access to my information? And whether that information was also changed. So I was talking about the scenario, right? Where someone could change uh, uh, my location data inside these databases and accu can accuse me as a potential uh, criminal, right? Uh, most of those people who were arrested in the Bhima Koregaon case were that. Essentially, they were nowhere in Pune during the Bhima Koregaon case, but they're all like, uh, you guys orchestrated this. You were the ones who uh, plotted this. You created unrest. You, you were planning to kill the prime minister. So the evidence can always be fabricated. Now, if, if such a digital evidence was fabricated, there is no way to know it because the logs are always with the, with the government itself, whether it's the MHA in this case or the other departments in case of Wahan, it's the Ministry of Road Transport. Uh, and there is this, there is, there has never been the concept of producing logs. Like in case of the Aadhaar case, I think that's the first time we saw that the UIDI CEO actually produced his logs from the uh, UIDI system, uh, but he never had to do that. It was a voluntary decision that he took to produce to the court that look, this is what we collect. But uh, there is no requirement under the law to actually uh, produce these because there is no law. And also because we don't know, we don't entirely know about how these systems are being made, uh, you don't know the accountability checks that exist in place. Right now, I can tell you for sure that the Telangana systems have no accountability. Whether it's governance or in, in, even in terms of technology, it's, it's the police who are always in, in control and you're looking at a very dystopian idea here when the police become the boss. It's not just uh, the home minister or uh, uh, the uh, judge or the uh, essentially officials, uh, representatives, but it's actually the police who is going to rule the society. And that's a very dangerous scenario that we need to watch out for. Anyone else has any more questions? Okay, I have to check if there are other questions on YouTube. Okay, I don't think anyone else has any questions, but okay, if you, we can end it here. Uh, if you want to know more about this, see anything that I said uh, is actually taken from 
official documentations from the MHA, uh, from uh, various departments, police departments, and it's all available uh, in the registration page. Uh, so if you have registered for this event on, on discussion on the Haskeek website, you can find all the uh, presentation by the NIC to MHA. Uh, you'll find uh, RTI filings, notings of uh, uh, MHA, and you will also find a couple of uh, NCRP papers on this. There is a paper where the NCRP actually, uh, one of the presenters actually talks about what the system's going to look like. It's from the NCRP journal of 2019. So where they only tell you to, which is where I found out that they plan to in integrate uh, uh, immigration and passport data into this. So you can check those details, uh, but you, you can also join us uh, on a public Telegram group. Uh, uh, the link is t.me slash k-a-a-r-a-n-a, k-a-a-r-a-n-a, telegram.me slash k-a-a-r-a-n-a. Okay, there is one question uh, on the YouTube, uh, I think, Satya Prashad, he's asking, does it make sense to have a central authority who is custodian of this data and claim laws around how and when access should be granted? Prasanna? So if all of this is digital evidence, who, how do you manage this? I mean, if you're entering to that phase of saying you will have to build such a system, you will have to monitor everyone. A, I don't think our laws would uh, allow that. So does it actually make sense to create such an authority to look at evidence? No. So that's effectively you are creating a sim sim single point of failure, right? So what is bad technical architecture is also bad legal architecture in many ways, right? So it is a single thing. It would, you are effectively creating a single point of failure. You're effectively creating a honey pot, right? So uh, we, that, that, that can effectively be hacked to hack the entire process. So why would you want to do that? So what, in fact, in many ways, in how our evidence system works is to be able to corroborate. So when A says something, in support of A saying it, if he's able to get B to say the same thing, C to say the same thing, and D to say the same thing, B, C, and D are effectively corroborating what A is saying. But if you have everything as one central uh, uh, certifying authority, what you're effectively saying is that's it, that you don't even need further corroboration. You just accept whatever that one person says as uh, the be all and end all. That is, that's more than anything else, that's imprudence. And uh, uh, yeah, if that is an evidence, in fact, you won't be able to even uh, convince a magistrate or a sessions judge that, that you've effectively proven that a particular person has committed a crime even if you create that one certifying authority. So I it have, is, in fact, it is in the interest of law enforcement that there are several authorities collecting their own data in the usual course of business that they do for their purposes. And if there is a crime that gets used at on demand for the purpose of investigation of that crime in order to solve that. Crime. In fact, it's in the interest of both law enforcement and the citizenry to have it that way. Okay, I have this question to you. The recent judgment in the Supreme Court on the uh, idea of electronic evidence, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That if electronic evidence is being collected from you, unless mm -hmm. you are provided with the certificate 65B, if I'm not wrong, yeah. uh, that evidence will not be considered uh, to be judicial evidence at all. Now, right. to what extent would that apply to the center system? Uh, well, so that's, in fact, I say that it, it would fall foul of that judgment where you say, so this, that judgment effectively says, if you are collecting electronic evidence and say that this, uh, the contents, the copies that are submitted to the court is actually the correct version of the electronic evidence that was as collected at the time it was collected. So you say there has to be somebody responsible who was in charge of those copying systems and in charge of those systems that collected that evidence to say, yes, this is in fact the correct copy of that original document that was collected at that time. So that's 
so this is the this is what the contents of the 65b certificate so we supreme court has had i mean it has had ups and downs i mean it in fact in in afzal guru's case it held you don't need to collect that certificate contemporaneous contemporaneously if you had not collected that certificate it is all right at the time of trial you summon that officer and the and the officer is at that time at a later time able to confirm that the contents are in fact proven the copy actual copies of the original that i was collected at that time so this changed in uh, anwar versus bashir later on many years later in fact uh, the trivia that you may want to know is that afzal in afzal guru's case the question was about the call data records as you know in parliament attacks so when the parliament of uh, india was attacked all those uh, uh, gun trotting terrorists who had attack, uh, attacked parliament had had been gunned down at, at on the spot so in fact the the whole thing of connecting the conspiracy to that event was call data records suggesting that afzal guru had been in touch with those who attacked in nepal so these call data records were question in fact uh, i mean in my reading that was the only evidence that linked afzal guru to the parliament attack and those call data records the question before the court was whether those call data records were admissible in evidence in view of 65b because there was no 65b certificate that was validly obtained under the evidence act at that time so they said so no, so now we can summon at the time of trial even though i mean there was no valid 65b at the time you collected the evidence from the uh, telecom companies etc now we can summon those officers and 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 let them certify that it was in fact correct so this 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 question of admissibility whether that kind of evidence without 65b certificate which came to be overturned so the abdul guru's case was expressly overturned after afzal guru had been convicted and had also been executed by that time so it was overturned in anwar versus bashir saying that 65b contemporaneously at the earliest and has to be produced for the court so there was a confusion in a later case that said it was anwar versus uh, there was next what is called i mean it was anwar versus bashir was incorrectly explained in the later case that explanation has effectively been that is said now in the most recent judgment so the anwar's position more or less is the same so so in electronic evidence now 65b has to be scrupulously followed at the time of evidence collection uh, the police will also need to collect the 65b certificate from those authorities that give them data for instance now if there is a crime investigation if police are collecting call data records from Uh, your mobile service provider the mobile service provider at the they need to give the call data records and contemporaneously give the 65b certificates to the um to the police the police failed to collect the 65b certificate the admissibility of that uh, those call data records at later point during the trial will be questioned i think i mean i don't think any of that is actually signed cryptographically to say that the evidence wasn't changed but let's see how uh, this will happen and how 65p gets implemented over time uh roini has one more question uh, would there not be a way for police using it only access or enter information only in an investigation or a judge to access the info only if the if they enter the case number so the essential question is what kind of access limitations would exist i mean in terms of cross departmental access like the judiciary may not have access to my call data records but because this data is being centralized at the mha and the ncrp the part of cctns so it's essentially an evolution of cctns right this is an entire mha database and the, it's the mha which is giving access to the judiciary at the same time getting access to the court records but i don't think that the judici- the mha actually needs the court records that way it, it's more interested in uh, personal information so the access limitations for mha does not exist and that then they are lobbying for 
there should be no limitations at all for the MHA, part of the privacy data protection bill, because if there are any restrictions or any oversight, forget restriction, even for all of this process, if there, there has to be say, an oversight by the judiciary on ICJS, right? Uh, even their lobbying against that, like that's something the Justice Sri Krishna committee proposed, right? There has to be some some judge who has to authorize the this access to this data, right? There has to be uh, a pro judicial procedure, and that was overturned essentially by Ministry of uh, Electronics and Information Technology, part of the current bill, and the Joint Parliamentary Committee is also being lobbied to further. Uh, bring it down to essentially ensure that MHA has no limitations and they could do whatever they want. But unfortunately, that's not how it should work. So well. it's important that the data protection bill and the joint parliamentary committee looks into a, a lot of these 360 degree profiles. Uh, it's not just at the MHA because when you say exemptions for government, it's not just for the Ministry, uh, Ministry of Home Affairs. The exemptions apply to state governments and to other departments as well, which are also trying to build larger other 360 degree profiles for welfare databases. But uh, And the MHA benefits in all of this because they have unlimited access to all of these other databases as right. well. So right. I, I think the larger issue is the structural dependence, right? Particularly it is, uh, is grave it's for, for the judiciary to depend on a government of India system like this. As it is, our judiciary is dependent on the government of India for a lot of things that compromises their independence in many ways. For example, they are reliant uh, for several things, their administ for administration, they re they are reliant on the government of India. When government of India is the largest litigant before the Supreme Court, right? um, uh, one great example also. Is, uh, in fact, if you see, Supreme Court of India is theoretically independent of the government of India because they are both co-equal constitutional authorities. Supreme Court is arguably a higher authority than the government of India because it's also the guardian of the constitution. But the Supreme Court website now, the, the link is sei.gov.in. Right. So it, it effectively, they, yeah. So similarly, so for all their IT purposes, relying on government of India is a recipe for disaster for citizens. Right. I mean, if, if they say, I mean, as it is, we are moving towards a place where Whatever the government says is taken at face value without cross-examination. That is a major issue that we're facing with our constitutional uh, adjudication now. And that is going to uh, be aggravated if all our IT systems that the judiciary uses are, are completely at the control at the beck and call, of the, particularly a body like ministry like the Ministry of Home Affairs. And uh, it's a structural issue. It's not just a functional issue. It's a structural issue in terms of, I mean, we, there may not be any conspiracy. MHA, for all we know, we know that, I mean, they may actually discharge their duties perfectly well with no malice intended, so no malefides there, etc. But it's not just a functional thing. It's a structural thing. So if, if the government, so that the judiciary to be independent of the government in as many ways as possible, it's a structural goal. It's, it's, a, it's a goal that we are in towards, and this is a significant setback to that. And the issue in terms of this idea and models of these databases, right? So they all say or claim that they are the single source of truth. Mm. So single source of truth <laughs> is an information model that has kind of come up uh, again. Uh, through the state resident data hubs at some level from Andhra Pradesh. Uh, that's what I could track to, but we really don't know. But it's used everywhere now. Uh, the Niti Aayog pushes it. They call it like Arogya Setu is the single source of truth for uh, COVID. Whether you're COVID positive or not, Arogya Setu will be the single source of truth. The MHA claims ICJS will be the single source of truth to uh, identify a criminal in the justice system. So everybody wants to propose their own uh, uh, single source of truth, but all of these single source of truth, for that to emerge, they all need all of your personal information to build 360 degree profile databases. 
So, and these 360 degree profile databases are emerging everywhere. Everyone cites our model is better than their model, like the MHS model is better than the Telangana State Police model, or the Department of Rural Department can say that, look, we have a better welfare model, which is better. At the end of the day, the experimentation that's happening because of solutionism and protectionism and this whole idea of national security or whatnot uh, is really concerning because you have agencies like the NIA, the National Investigation Agency, which is claiming they need all of this for to basically track terrorists. If you looked at the <laughs> slides of ICJS, you would see that NIA is mentioned. Now, mm. the NIA, which is tracking the prime minister's uh, threat to the prime minister or going around the Bhima Koregaon case, is unable to provide any evidence. And the entire evidence for the case that they have is a lot of terabytes of uh, 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 di digital evidence, which uh, which potentially leads to that it has been planted. There are the questions on how much of the evidence is true or not. So this is really challenging, especially when UAPA is being imposed on everyone, including for uh, sending emails, right? So this is really problematic if they start trying to trace uh, your web IPs and start trying to trace everything from ICJS and you become part of the criminal justice system, just because you sent an email to the minister uh, is really concerning. So the amount of power that information is leading to these agencies is what uh, that we're trying to question here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the I mean, single source of truth. I mean, the necessary implication is that you are erasing all other sources of truth. You are eliminating all other sources of truth, right? Either as gaslighting, gas saying they're all false. Or just say, I mean, it's, I mean, they're just not feasible to even collect them. And so that's, it's, yeah, therefore there is, I mean, the problem, deeply problematic even at that level, right at the, the level of conception. 